So now that we have our cursor hiding and capturing and our raw input, we can actually use that to control the camera now. So, camera.h, uh, I've replaced those parameters, r, theta, phi, pitch, yaw, roll. We've replaced that with the position of the camera, x, y, z, and the pitch and the yaw of the camera. Also got a couple of constants here, the travel speed, which is the speed that you travel when you're pressing WASD, and your rotation speed, which is basically how fast you uh, rotate when you move your mouse. Got a couple of interface functions here, rotate and translate. DX and DY are mouse deltas, and this translation is, uh, you know, just a vector. Also added a constructor here for some reason. So the camera constructor just calls reset, resets all the camera parameters, and what else we got here? Get matrix now. Uh, so what I originally what I tried is I tried just do a matrix translation, doing the opposite of the camera position. Because remember, the camera moves up. Everything on the screen is going to be moving down relative to the screen. I hope you can understand that. So if we just do the negative of all of these parameters, it should work. Well, I mean, I thought maybe it would work. It's worth a try, right? It doesn't work. Mm, spoilers. But, uh, so we'll do that. And for the imgui stuff here, now the slider is going to be X, Y, Z, and pitch and yaw. And uh, reset, we'll just set all those parameters. Camera rotate is going to take the DX and the DY, multiply them by the rotation speed. And it is going to either wrap the angles around or it is going to clamp them. So in pitch, looking up and down, you want it, I want it to clamp. So if you look all the way up, you'll, you just keep pressing the mouse up, you'll just be pointing up. You won't go around or anything. But for uh, yaw, for spinning around on your axis, basically, uh, you want that to wrap. So you, if you keep moving to the right, you'll just keep spinning around. Uh, and the camera translation. All right, so when you press W on the keyboard, you want to move forwards, but you want to move forwards relative to where the camera is currently pointing, right? So that means that you've got to take the camera's uh, rotation, its orientation, into account. So what we do is we load from this XM float 3, we load it into an XM vector. Uh, and then we're going to transform that three-dimensional vector with a matrix. And that matrix is going to be the rotation of the camera, and it's also going to be scaled by the travel speed in the X, Y, and Z. Uh, so that will give us our rotation. So if we, for example, if we if our pass in a Z, a translation that is just Z equal to one, X and Y equal to zero, that'll basically be mean move forward relative to the camera. Then that will be translated based on the rotation of the camera to whatever direction the camera is actually pointing and it'll be scaled by the travel speed. And uh, then we can just Take the position is equal to the position x, y, and z plus the translation that we calculated in here. That's a basic how it works. Looks like I made some modifications to the uh, the model here. Probably nothing too big. Um, point light, I changed its default starting position. In app.h, I added a uh, boolean to control the uh, the demo window it's display, so you can close it. I removed that raw input window. That was just for testing purposes. I also changed the uh, the key that captures the mouse. I changed it from insert to escape. So you press the escape key to move into free look mode and move out of free look mode. You can press F1 to show the demo window. And here's where the good stuff is. If, if the cursor is not enabled, that means we're in free look mode. So then we want to take the, the WASD keys and R and F and translate those into translations on the camera. Likewise, we want to process all the raw input delta messages. And if the, uh, if the cursor is not enabled, we're in free look mode. So we want to trans translate those uh, deltas into rotations of the camera. All right, so here's our scene. The light is now starting off in a better position here. Uh, the camera is also starting off in a little better position. We can control the pitch of the camera and the, uh, the yaw of the camera. Seems all right. Uh, we can move the camera, you know, up and down, left and right, whatever you like. But now, let's press escape. Let's go into free look mode. So now if I rotate, I'm moving my mouse left and right, up and down. Looks pretty good, right? 
let's press W. Ah, we're moving in. We're going up, we're moving in. It's beautiful. If I press R and F, I can elevate and uh, descend. So it looks like we've solved the problem. But now let me show you something a little interesting. Turn to the right. Move back here. Now watch what happens when I pitch up and down. Hmm. Hmm. There's something, something doesn't look quite right. Why? Why are you the way that you are? Well, like I kind of alluded to, this is no good. This roll pitchy uh, with, uh, you know, negative angles, it's not going to cut it for the camera look. It doesn't work well. It works well sometimes, but uh, when you apply the transformations like that in that order, it just doesn't work. And you can actually, if you visualize it, if you take that situation that I created and you visualize it yourself and you apply the transformations, first the pitch, then the yaw, you will realize, yeah, it does rotate the, the, uh, the model in a way which doesn't make any sense considering the actual orientation of the camera. So, what is the solution? The actual solution is to use a function in DirectX Math that is specifically tailored to this sort of situation. It's called XM Matrix Look At, and uh, it allows you to give a position of a camera, give the position of the target to look at, and then the position of a vector that represents um, where the top of the camera should point, in which direction should the top of the camera point. Because you can have a camera that's at position A and that's pointed at position B, but it can still, you know, rotate, do a barrel roll, and there are many different possible orientations. So this third parameter here nails down the, uh, the corkscrew barrel roll orientation of the camera. So camera position is easy, we've already got that. Camera target is basically just the camera position plus a vector that is pointed in the direction that our camera is pointed. Now our camera is pointed uh, based on pitch and yaw. So what we can do, we define our camera by default to be pointed in the positive Z direction. That's our base camera vector. Then we can transform that with the roll pitch yaw to get its current orientation. And then once we have that, camera target is just the position plus that look vector. Then we can call camera look at to get the transformation matrix that should be applied to all the objects that the camera is viewing. And we pass in the position, the target, and the up vector. And we want up to be positive Y. So this will align the camera's roll such that it is aligned with the Y axis as much as possible. And that's all you need to change is this one little thing in here. All right, moment of truth. Good in the free look mode. So far so good. Yeah. Check out the check out the junk. The junk looks good. Now let's uh, let's do this. Going back, uh, a little weird. Elevate, back out, pitch up, pitch down. It's looking not retarded. Yeah, looks good. That's normal. You had me you had me a little worried for a second because it looks slanty, but that's just normal perspective. It works. By golly. It works. It's a beautiful piece of art. Now, there's one minor problem with this, and that is, well, let's go. Let's go for the junk view, and we're gonna look all the way up. And what? No, something's weird. It's kind of really bad. So when the pitch goes up to negative ninety, and it's the same if you put it down to positive ninety degrees, it gets very funky. And the reason for that is because, remember, the, the, uh, the camera orientation, the thing that um, constrains its final axis, is a vector pointing directly up. But if the camera is pointing in the, same, in the exact same direction as the constraint vector, there is no longer anything that can constrain it, because they're the same vector. So its rotation, its roll, becomes unconstrained, and that's not a good scene. So, very simple way to fix that. Just constrain the pitch instead of being between, you know, plus and minus 90 degrees. Make it between plus and minus, you know, 90 degrees within 0.5%. So not quite 90 degrees, but 99.5% of 90 degrees. And that little, that little fudge factor is enough to make it so that you don't mess up your viewing vector. So that now is our friend. The camera looking very nice indeed. We can 
can zoom into the junk, we can look all the way up in the junk, junk cam and rotate, and no problems. Everything's good. Camera is fully constrained because it's never going to exactly 90 degrees. It's only going very close to 90 degrees. Beautiful. Okay, so with this, you know, situation all figured out, now, while I was doing this development and testing things out, I stumbled a, upon a little bug that I had created in the previous lesson. Uh, so if we look at our good old friend, the tree here, the node tree, let's do some, let's do some settings here. Let's, let's change some stuff. We're going to, we're going to move the hand a little bit. Beautiful. Now we're going to collapse this. Now we're going to click here. Oh my God. He's been decapitated. Oh, the humanity. So what went wrong? Well, if we click back on the hand, the hand's fine. Then we click back on the, uh, let's click on the helmet. Oh, the helmet's back on the head now. What is going on? What happened? Well, the way our current system works is it, when we render this window, is going to recursively go through this tree and it is going to recursively assign IDs to each of the nodes in this tree. And those IDs are going to be used to um, reference data that is stored in an associated container. Now, the IDs that are assigned to each of these nodes is going to vary depending on how the tree is actually recursed, how it's processed. So if this node is expanded here, then this is going to be processed this is going to be, you know, node 0, this is going to be node 1, this is going to be node 2, node 3, node 4, etc, etc. But if they're closed, this one node 0, this one becomes node 1, this one becomes node 2, node 3, node 4. So you see, I can set, you know, a value for the hand here, that'll be assigned to some kind of ID in our container, but then if you change the, uh, the construction of the tree, that is going to be applied to some different element later on. And that's no good, right? So we want IDs to be stable, irregardless of the state of this widget here. That's not a good scene. So we've got to we've got to do a little bit more. So what I ended up doing here is giving each node its own unique ID. That's not a bad idea, I figured. And that is going to be assigned to every node during parsing. So now, instead of passing in a reference to an int here in the show tree stuff, we're passing in a reference to the int in the parse node because. The, the parsing of the tree, it's always going to be parsed in the same way every time you load that tree. Whereas the uh, show tree is going to be a different order, different assignment of IDs depending on what nodes have been expanded and collapsed. So, we do that, add some functions here like get ID, and it's all good, right? In mesh.cpp, the constructor for node now takes an ID, sets that ID. Uh, let's see here, you can get the ID, very simple. Down here in parse node, it now takes a reference to an integer that is going to track the IDs to be assigned to every node. And that's done down here. So when you call make unique to create a new node, you pass in the ID. You also increment it at the same time and you pass that on in the recursion of parse node. So once every node has its own ID, it's then, you know, it's very simple. When you want to show the tree, you no longer have to pass in the index tracker. You just pass in the selected index and the pointer to the selected node. And then in show tree, like I said, you don't need to get in the uh, index tracker anymore. All you're going to do is check to see if the current node's ID is equal to the selected index. And now the ID that's used for imgui for the, uh, the tree, instead of that being the tracked value, the reference, that's just you, you just call get ID to get that. And when you're determining which item is selected, you use get ID to get that index. And that fixed the problem. I won't bother showing you, not really much to see it, just that that problem doesn't happen anymore. But then that allowed me to make a nice little refinement to the code, a little refactoring. One thing that I never liked about the code was the fact that when you call show tree, you had to pass in the selected index and the selected node, even though these two things aren't independent. Every selected index will implicate a specific pointer to a selected node. So, but now that every node knows its own index, knows its own ID, we can just reduce that down to pointer to selected node. We can eliminate this redundancy. I also changed the naming from index. I removed the index and changed it to ID. So now to get the selected ID, 
you just check to see whether the print selected uh, pointer is null pointer. If it's a null pointer, selected ID is negative one, means invalid value. Otherwise, call get ID on that node, and you've got the selected ID. And then you just use that like you use it before. No need now to set the selected index. You just need to set the pointer. Cleaner code. And now when you call show tree, you just got to pass in that pointer. Here, when you're accessing the uh, associative container, just call get ID. And now we can remove that selected index from the model window altogether. It's not needed. So beautiful. Code has become cleaner. I love it. Final commit here doesn't, doesn't mean crap. I just, what did I do here? Uh, I was making model window a friend. And then I made some, and I was making this private. So I just made it public and made him no longer a friend. No big deal. I didn't think friend access was particularly warranted here. Wasn't gaining much from it. And there you have it. You've got your free camera look. And I hope you'll agree it is quite sexy. It's going to make our life easier when we're inspecting scenes to be able to position the camera in the exact position that we want. Maybe to check for uh, things like specular. That was pretty hard to do with our orbital camera setup that we had before. Uh, but yeah, lots of pieces to put together. But we put them together and it works fine. In the next video, uh, what are we going to do? Well, I think it's now time to move on with our loading of model assets. We've, we've loaded the geometry. We haven't loaded any of the materials yet, the texture and so forth. So in the next video, we're going to look at loading and rendering the materials of a model. But until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. Helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more hardware 3D.